Well, hello. It's um, good for you to uh, have invited me to speak to you again, and it's a real privilege to be able to do so and to speak to you in your own homes. Today, we're going to be looking together at Luke chapter 7, verses 1 to 10, as we continue our journey through the Gospel of Luke. Um, now, as we do this and as we go into the Gospel, um, I think it's important for me to remind you that Luke never attempted a strict chronological order to his gospel. Um, the gospel is written with an eye to using the events of Jesus' life to illuminate different aspects of what is taking place. And that's one of the things that I really like about the different gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. They're all looking at the same event, the same situation, but for, through a different camera lens and from a different angle, a different camera angle. And when we Put of all of that together, we get a very rich, multi-dimensional understanding of what was taking place. And it's uh, very, very informative. And today we are looking in Luke's Gospel at the healing of the centurion's servant, Luke 7, 1 to 10. And this follows directly on from the teaching of Jesus about the wise and foolish builders. And I think Luke chose to put it there deliberately. Let me Remind you how Jesus finishes that teaching, uh, Luke 6, verse 49. The one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Well, I think it's deliberate that this is there. And um, let's take a look at um, what happened with the healing of the centurion's servant. At its simplest level, this is about a man, the centurion, who is deeply hurting because a servant who he loves is ill to the point of death. And in, pain, in faith, the centurion takes his own pain to Jesus um, to ask for a healing. And uh, I'm going to give you a spoiler alert now. Sorry about this. The servant is also healed. And it's a story, I believe, that can speak into our lives today. Now, when I was beginning to prepare this sermon, I had a bit of a mishap. And, and I think this mishap was a, a sort of has enabled me to speak into um, this, this particular passage. My son had bought a bike, uh, but he had a problem with this bike. The, the saddle post didn't quite fit properly into the frame of the bike and no matter how tight he tightened up the the bolt as he rode along the saddle would just slowly slip further and further down and so my son came to me and he said dad what can I do to fix this well I I knew what to do and I, I said to my son come with me I think we can fix this quite easily and I took a can of beer I pulled the beer out and then I got some scissors and I cut a rectangle out of the can of the the metal Form that into a tube, put that tube into the frame of the bike, then put the seat post in, tighten it up, hey presto, absolutely perfect, the seat post does not go up and down. And possibly, for the first time in about 25 years, my son looked at me with respect because of my technical abilities. But there was a bit of a problem. And uh, if you're ever going to try this at home, what I want to tell you to do is beware. Because whilst it is possible to cut a can with a pair of scissors because the, the metal is so thin, what it does do is leave a razor sharp edge to it. And as I was trying to fix the bike and fix the seat post, I got a nick in my thumb. Now, this was one of those horrible little nicks. You know, it's not deep enough for stitches or anything like that, but it jolly well hurts and it took a long time to heal. And as I was preparing this sermon over the days, the, the, the little pain of that thumb was constantly there. And even now, uh, over a week later, I can still feel it if I just press it, press it in. Now, what I'm not looking for here is your sympathy. There's lots of other people who need your sympathy a lot more than I do. But what I want to share with you is that as I felt my thumb hurting, 
I was nudged by God, I feel, to think about the other areas of my life where there is hurt. And as I was reflecting on that, I realised there's quite a lot of hurt that I carry around with me. And as I was preparing this sermon, I realised that amongst my friends at Oaken Baptist Church, amongst you dear people watching this at home, there's going to be quite a lot of hurt. Maybe not everybody's got it, but there's going to be a significant amount of hurt. And it's something that we all have in common. We're hurting in different ways. And so I wonder, what is your hurt? Where is your hurt? And I'm not talking about a cut thumb or finger. What I'm talking about is the pain of the person who you might have deeply loved and cared about, but who betrayed you. You now live with the pain of hurt and a broken relationship. I'm talking about the pain maybe of injustice. I'm talking about the pain that you might have caused yourself or other people by making wrong choices or taking bad decisions. I'm talking about the pain of worrying about family, friends and relatives. Of waking in the middle of the night with that anxiety as you worry about them. I'm talking about the pain of regrets. I should have done this or I should have done that. I'm talking about the pain of fear, the fear of COVID or the fear of the end of lockdown or the fear of continuing lockdown, fear of returning to school or work or maybe even the fear of redundancy. I'm talking about the pain of loneliness, loss or bereavement. I'm talking about the pain of addiction or the pain of mental and physical poor health. I'm talking about the pain of knowing that you're not what you present to the world and the pain of knowing how exhausting that can be. And so as as I was preparing this talk, that tiny painful little cut on my thumb opened my eyes to the pain that is all around and I confess is in me in different ways. And I just wonder, does this resonate with you? Or are you just watching me and thinking, oh, thank goodness I don't have the pain that Graham has? I doubt it. I think we're all hurting in different ways to different levels. Well, I've got some good news for you. God walks with us in our pain and he's ready to deal with it when we are. So let's go to the story of the centurion and discover how we might bring our faith, uh, sorry, our pain to Jesus. So let's take a look. What do we know about the centurion? Well, he was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. And in the sort of in that um, culture of the time, he was an outsider of the Jewish faith. But he was sympathetic to the Jewish cause and a benefactor of the local synagogue. He was respected by the Jewish leaders. His love and concern for his servant reveals a kind character. He was a man of authority, used to giving orders and receiving them. And his servant was seriously ill. And so he hears of Jesus and he sends Jewish elders to ask Jesus to come. And the Jewish elders, we are told by Luke, respectfully come to Jesus And plead earnestly with him. This man deserves your help. He's a good man. He has rebuilt our our synagogue. He is uh, is a, a supporter of our nation. Well, let's take a little look at that. They told Jesus he deserves your help because of what he has done. Their message is he has earned the right to be helped. Now that echoes the way that the Jewish faith was being taught at the time. You earn God's favour through your own efforts. But we know that Jesus came with a message that was different to that. The message of Jesus challenges is that through, through his teaching, through his life, through his example, through his death and resurrection. Jesus taught that you come into relationship with God by receiving God's gift of grace. And then you respond to that with the living worship of a transformed life. But Jesus agrees to go with them. I assume he already knows the humble heart of the centurion, which has been misrepresented by the embellishments of the Jewish elders. 
But on the way to the centurion, they are met by other friends of the centurion with a message that is totally different to the message given by the elders. Now, I am supposing here that these other friends that we meet in this um, in the uh, narrative here were possibly soldiers who understood the importance of giving accurate messages word for word. So let's look at that word for word. Jesus is addressed as Lord, a term of honour, respect and recognition of who Jesus was. And he's told, do not trouble yourself. I do not deserve for you to come under my roof. I am not worthy to come before you. I recognise my sin and failings. How could such a man as I stand before a man such as you, is what the centurion is saying, let alone invite you to come into my house? There is deep humility in this and a deep recognition of sin. But he goes on. But say the word and my servant will be heard, healed. A word from you is enough. The centurion has complete faith in Jesus. He's not asking for anything ritualistic or elaborate. He just has deep faith and he recognises that a word is enough. And then to go on and paraphrase verse 8. He is told that I recognise you as a man of authority. So here is a man, the centurion, who knows exactly what authority is. He knows how it works. He sits under the authority of a commanding officer. He sits under the command, or the, the chain of command that takes you right up to Caesar himself. And he also has authority in his own men. But this man, this centurion, recognises an authority greater than all of that in Jesus. And this man, the centurion, identifies with Jesus as a man of authority. Your authority, Jesus, is so great. A word from you is enough. Well, I look at this as the parable of the wise and foolish builder in action. The centurion has deep foundations of faith that is so clear to see. And Jesus responds. Verse 9. I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. A big challenge that would have been to the Jewish elders who were listening in. Here is a Gentile Roman soldier with greater faith than them. And we know, and we read on, the servant was immediately healed. So what has all of this got to say to us, to people who are hurting in the middle of a Covid crisis? Well the message here is bring your brokenness and your pain to Jesus. We are not designed by our maker to have knotted stomachs filled with anxiety. We are not designed to wake in the night fretting about stuff. We're not designed to carry the burden of addictions and other stuff. We're not designed to carry unforgiveness of people who have hurt and damaged us. We're not designed to be paralysed by fear of the unknown, whether that is a Covid virus or a difficult social or work situation. Bring your brokenness and pain to Jesus. Not because you have earned a right to do it, but because Jesus invites you to do it. Come to him. But how? How do you approach the creator of the universe with your pain? Well, this passage tells us. First, come in faith. Second, come in humility. Third, recognise Christ's authority and your identity in him. Fourth, act on God's answer. Five, build your life on the solid rock of faith in Jesus. So let's go through those. First of all, come in faith. I don't know how much faith you have to bring before God. But let me tell you, 
God will work with whatever you have. Don't treat faith as something that earns a response from God. Just bring your faith, however much. Wrap it in the tears of a broken heart and God will deal with that. And he will help your faith to grow. Secondly, come in humility, recognising who he is and who we are. We come with nothing to earn God's grace. So what can we bring to offer? We bring our lives. Our lives that are tarnished by all kinds of stuff. Stuff that has happened to us, stuff that we've done to ourselves and to others. Sin is the word that describes this. In humility, with open hearts, we are to come and lay all of that down before God. The mess, the sins, the pain, the hurts, however caused. Bring it all to God. Lay it at the foot of the cross with open, humble hearts. And then third, recognise Christ's authority. What he says goes. Sitting under Christ's authority means we take his response. We don't try and limit it, we submit to it. And recognising Christ's authority also helps us to be reminded that our identity is as a child of God, not in our pain. That is so important. You are identified by your faith in Jesus not in your pain. And I know people who over the years have carried that pain that it has become their identity. The identity of the abandoned wife or abandoned husband or the identity of someone with a particular illness, whatever it might be. No, your identity is not in your pain. Your identity is in Jesus Christ. Fourth, Act on God's answer. Now that's not easy. Sometimes we do not bring our pain to Jesus because we know what the response will be. The hurt we feel about a betrayal that has gone to the, the very core of our being. Sometimes we don't bring that to Jesus because we know what the response will be. The response is to forgive. But we're to bring it. And then we are to act on God's answer. And we could get different answers from God. It could be not yet. There is something more for you to learn or experience. And as you are being transformed by the pain that you are experiencing. Maybe God's answer has already been given. Maybe you've already received it and not acted upon it. Or maybe... There could be an immediate answer, an immediate healing. Whatever the answer is, act on it. Don't compromise it or blend it with the answer you would have preferred to have had or the answers that you're taking from the world or the answers that you're taking from your own preferences. Accept God's answer and act on it. And then fight fifth. Build your life on the solid rock of faith in Jesus. This will equip you to withstand the storms and the torrents that come your way. It will equip you to act on God's answer to your pain. And it will give you a hope, a living hope that is the antidote to all the rubbish that this world will throw in your direction. And you will discover that Jesus is greater than any limitations we or other people put on us. Pain is part of life. It is not failure. Being a Christian does not make you immune from it. But God will walk with you through it. Sometimes healing or removing it. Sometimes allowing us to learn from it, but always bearing it with us. The most important thing for you to know 
is with faith, with God in your life. You are never alone. We are children of the living God. Our hope is in him. Let me finish with some words from Matthew's Gospel. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Amen.